I talk about the practicalities of cover cropping and, and uh, the effects that we've seen in, in some of our trials. So um, some of you might know actually this guy on the right here, that's Chris Penfold. He's, he's been doing cover cropping for quite a while and people often tell me to talk to him about cover cropping. Um, <laughs> and I said, I've been working with him, with him for four years. Um, we talk about cover cropping all the time. So um, a few thank yous to give actually before we get into this. Um, Chris and Tim um, and the, the site managers from the sites that we are working on, um, Phil Riley, CMV down at Langhorne Creek, and um, Joe's a PhD student of ours that's just about to submit. Um, so I was lucky enough to stumble into this field trial four years ago um, out of my PhD, and uh, it's a field trial that was established back in um, 2014 or 15, I believe. Maybe 16, actually. Um, and I came into it in 2018 and got to start collecting data and exploring how cover crops were influencing grapevines and the soil. Um, so initially, we'll sort of zoom out and talk about cover crops again from, from a perspective of why they're useful. And, and, and then we can go into some of the results. And I think then we get to do a bit of a panel discussion, which is always interesting because there are always new ideas. Um, there have already been a few this, this afternoon. So these are, this is the system we're looking at. And, and what you've got here on the right really is, is a monoculture, right? We've got our, our crop species and then bare earth, and that's largely the status quo. I'm excluding the mid-row because you know, in, in viticulture, people tend to let the mid-row grow um, and they'll slash it and maybe so, quite a lot of people put, put mid-row cover crops in, um, but they don't tend to do a lot. And as Tim was saying with the Arbuscular mycorrhizae, the interactions between roots and, and fungus, um, especially some of these really meaningful interactions that happen on a, on a smaller scale, 30, you know, 40 centimetres, they're not, they're not massive. So on the right here, we've got a monoculture. On the left, we've got the ecosystem. And this is, this is one of the medic and rye um, treatments. Um, Jeremy might be surprised that we didn't spray this one. <laughs> we've let this grow, and each year we've let it grow to complete maturity. And we haven't pulled out the weeds, we haven't adjusted that. Um, and so what's been built there is an ecosystem, and it's reached, over the last six or seven years, it's reached some sort of steady state, which means um, it's not in a flux, it's not adapting to these new things that are growing in there, and there's there's no massive change in, in nutrient concentration. It's kind of it's kind of happy, and so when you're managing your your vineyard or your orchard or whatever agricultural system you're you're running, you're making a decision between an ecosystem and a monoculture at some point. And I guess there are some really important questions that that you should probably be confident in. Um, when making that decision. And, and one of the most obvious ones is how much does it cost to maintain that bare earth? And there is definitely a cost associated with that. Two or three passes per year with a tractor that's spraying um, maybe 330 bucks a hectare. That was an estimate I heard. It's, it might have gone up actually since fuel has gone up. So wouldn't be surprised if it's more. And what do you get in return for that expense? What's your return on, on investment you get a nicely managed undervine or orchard floor, um, and you don't have to deal with weeds, and maybe harvest is a bit more easy. You don't have things tickling your grapes and getting damaged fruit, and you know, perhaps you feel like there are fewer snakes around. I don't think that's necessarily true. Um, but what, what don't you get when you make that decision? You're making that call to, to spray out the undervine space and the floor as we've already heard from Mark and Tim, there, there are quite a few things that you are probably missing out on. Obviously, there's no roots in the soil right there, apart from your, your cash crop. And you can be pretty sure there's more roots in the soil where there's a cover crop than there, there is otherwise. And when you don't have roots, you don't have fungi, you don't have these mycorrhizal fungi and other fungi breaking down dead organic matter. And because of that, you're not having these mycorrhizal interactions occurring and your cash crop isn't being able to interact with, with the mycorrhizae like it would otherwise. And, and so 
your plants are maybe having to work a bit harder, but, but really what you're having to do as the, as the, as the farmer, as the, as the site manager, you're, you're having to put inputs into your soil there. You're going to have to fertilise the ground because otherwise you're not going to get the crop that you expect. Um, if you've got legumes, like in the medic and rye cover crop, there's no rhizobia, so there's no organic nitrogen, there's no nitrogen breakdown and mineralisation. Um, so you're having to add that too. And on top of that, you're losing out on soil structure. Um, you're probably going to have higher rates of, or higher compaction of your soil when you're driving through. There, there's more passes per year. Um, and you also miss out on soil carbon. And Jeremy was talking, it was a great example about the infiltration rates of, um, of water you know, with a cover crop and not. And we saw exactly the same thing in our trials. Um, I had some students out there a couple of years ago, ring infiltrometer. They were just waiting there for ages and ages with the herbicide for the water to go in. And then you'd put it in on where one of the cover crops had been and it just disappears. And it's not true infiltration, but it's, um, it's, a, it's a good proxy for what you might see when it rains. You know, the water's going straight into the profile being absorbed and, and um, is accessible and it's going to run off and, and leave your property. And lastly, I guess we can talk about weed, weed suppression, mulch. If you've got a good cover, it's going to reduce evaporation. It's going to keep the soil surface a bit cooler. Um, your, your, your plant, your cash crop roots are going to enjoy that. It makes it a bit easy for them to grow. Um, you get a habitat for beneficial insects, which can predate and um, reduce pest species and um, reflected heat, and that goes in with the, the reduced evaporation. So there are so many benefits that you get by having something there that you're excluding when you make that decision to spray. And um, it's an important decision to make. And obviously spraying hasn't ruined our yields. You know, everyone has been spraying for a long time. There's a reason it's effective. And, um, you know, yields are not bad when you, you use herbicide to manage, um, manage weeds. But what we're suggesting and what our research is finding is that there's, there's probably a better way to do it. Um, that means you don't have to spray all the time um, and you still get all these benefits. And I, I think the really important point is it depends on the species you select. So um, when you have aggressive perennial grasses that are growing through summer um, in these treatments here, and I've got a photo in a second, you can really see without even having to measure it the impact on the canopy of the grapevines. Um, those vines are stunted, their yields are far, far lower than the herbicide control, but also the other treatments where there is the right kind of cover crop, where the medic and rye um, has been planted. So species selection is really important, and from the findings of our work, um, a mixture of grass and a legume has been re really effective. The medic and the rye has been great, but there have to be many more ways to do exactly the same thing. Um, by getting the legume and the, the nitrogen fixation um, to balance with sort of more um, intense grasses like rye, um, you get this happy medium where you're getting some extra nitrogen to the soil. And I think that extra nutrient content is, is maybe balancing out the, the losses that you might have by having a grass there. Um, but the reason you would have the grass there at all is because it has a higher C2N ratio and it doesn't break down as fast as Medic. So if you just have Medic there, um, it will stick around for a while, but it, it breaks down. The bugs really love eating it. Um, and I don't necessarily mean insects, I mean microbes um, will break Medic um, tissue down quite, quite quickly compared to something like oats or um, oat or rye. Um, so good to have a legume and the perennial species tend to reduce figure in these dry systems, um, but also um, at Langhorn Creek where our, our trial site is regularly irrigated and well, quite heavily irrigated, not as much as up here, but still, you know, six or seven meg um, per hectare I think goes on, you know, per year. It's pretty, pretty serious irrigation. So um, you still see a reduction in vigour even when there's lots of irrigation. Um, as I mentioned in the field, native species fall under this like perennial grass scenario where you might expect to see a bit of reduction in vigour, but they do provide other benefits and they provide habitat and um, 
and food sources for, for all sorts of insects. And if you want to bring beneficial insects into your, your, um, your farm, native grasses are a good way to do that. But you don't necessarily have to grow it directly in your dripper line. You, know, you can use that in mid rows and you could alternate things. There's ways to incorporate that that, um, that make it effective. Um, and I guess another question is, and it's, I don't know, it's a bit ridiculous for me to state this, but what will you do when glyphosate is banned? You know, if, if, her, if you couldn't use herbicide and there were some really key ones that you had to stop using, you know, on a short term, what would you do? What's the plan? Um, there will be, always be some sort of, you know, herbicide that's, that's um, available, but if you could start moving towards a system where you don't need to rely on it so heavily earlier, then you can still use it, like Jeremy has for, for their trial, to, to knock down crops when you think you know, there's too much growth happening or there's too much stunting. Um, but it gives you that seed bank in the soil that will actually start growing again you know, the next year. So these are the treatments that we've had in the, in the trial. We don't need to go through them all too much. We did compare straw mulch, so just plain um, wheat mulch with uh, a medic mix, so just a couple of different medic species, and then this is a medic and rye species. Um, the Casbah coxfoot, which is really quite an aggressive perennial grass, um, we compared that with a fescue and clover, and that's an interesting one actually. If you look there now, it's purely clover, uh, purely fescue. There's, no, there's really no clover around at all. Uh, initially, before I started on this project, it was purely clover, and the clover dominated remediated the soil and the fescue said thanks very much and has completely covered it over now. It looks like a really nice lawn. Um, so I don't even refer to this as fescue and clover much anymore. It's really just fescue um, and we've seen a reduction in uh, yields in that treatment. Um, and lastly, wallaby grass. So we've all seen you know, herbicide under vine, nice big green leafy canopies. Um, these are all taken at different times but um, so we can't really compare. This is much earlier in the season. This is our medic and rye, um, but you can see a lot of barley grass and, and other species have been recruited there. On the left here is the straw mulch applied at 50 tonnes per hectare, and that lasts three or four years um, per application. Um, beyond that is the um, Casbah coxfoot, which is quite aggressive. You can see it's very tall and very green. Here it is again. Um, this was put in on the assumption that it was actually an annual coxfoot, but, but it didn't end up being annual at all. It just kept growing all the way through summer. Um, and the vines are stunted as well. This is your fescue and clover, um, one of the rare patches where you can actually see some clover coming through. And on the left here is some wallaby grass and some other wildly recruited species. I like to include this. This is cyanobacteria, uh, I think. I did a PhD in algae, uh, so, so that's my best guess. And you don't really want to be culturing cyanobacteria on the, on the surface of your, um, your vineyard, although it is nitrogen fixing, some of it, but um, we haven't tested the nitrogen fixation of algae in, in vineyards. Um, so we talked about the, that competitive grass and reduction in vigor um, scenario before. This is, this is what we see, and these are, I think these photos were taken fairly closely, um, and we have the, the soil moisture probe there for scale, and they're about the same. But you can see that the mass of the canopy here with a medic mix, and on the left here, the Casbah, much smaller canopy, um, and that's pretty classic for what we found across our sites. If you have a, a perennial aggressive grass, you see a reduction in vigor. Um, and, and you know, total growth rate essentially and yields. Um, whereas the medic mix tends to produce really big canopies, um, thicker, stronger canes as well, which is interesting. So we've looked at lots of things throughout the, the years. One of the last things we looked at was cumulative temperature across the, um, across the season. And the way that I've structured these slides on, on, on your left, you've got Nuriutpa data. On the right, we've got Langhorne Creek data. So, um, Nuriup is a lot drier than Langhorn Creek, um, but it's not irrigated very much, whereas the Langhorn Creek's irrigated quite highly. So those, those management decisions make a big impact on the, the effect of cover crops and, and what's happening. Um, 
So um, you can see total um, cumulative temperature um, in Langhorne Creek is a lot lower because it doesn't get as hot there as it does in, um, in the Riverland. Straw mulch leads to a lot cooler soil surface than the medic and rye and the fescue and the, and the herbicide. So there's just not a hugely dense mat there at Newry or at, um, at Langhorn Creek with the, the medic and rye. So it doesn't influence the, the direct surface temperature that much. Um, total soil carbon, and a, a paper came out very recently by uh, our PhD student, Joe Marks, um, showing that, um, that um, soil carbon with the medic and rye treatment was, was up to 23% higher Actually, sorry, I think on average 23% higher than the herbicide, and this is soil organic carbon than the herbicide treatment. Um, and this, this data was from a year or two beforehand. So big surprise if you're growing things on the surface, um, you're gonna in increase your soil organic carbon. Soil microbiome, so we, Tim was talking about microbial diversity. We saw higher diversity um, when you grow cover crops, but interestingly, there's still a fair bit of diversity relatively high diversity in, um, in your herbicide treatment. So the, the key takeaway from there, uh, for me, from, from that is that there, there are a lot of different species there regardless of what you're doing. And you know, that, that old, that cliche, if you build it, they will come. Um, if you start putting cover crops in, there are going to be the right species somewhere nearby that will come and colonize the niche that you've created for them. So soil amendments and, and you know, adding mycorrhizal spores and things. Maybe there's room for that. I'm skeptical that it's really critical. The most important thing is that you're creating a habitat for it. So if you can start growing things, you'll get mycorrhiza start, that start forming symbiotic relationships with your, your crops. Um, this bearded dragon actually has been hanging around in this vineyard for quite a while. And um, you, you do, you know, you tend to find things like that, higher order predators where there's a, you know, plenty, of, um, plenty of feed for them. Soil compaction, uh, we talked about um, compaction from um, vehicle passes, but directly in the undervine, um, these samples were taken and you can see at both sites, herbicide treatment, this is in the zero to 10 centimeter layer, um, compaction of the pressure that's required to push the penetrometer through the soil is much higher in the zero to 10 at both sites. And really, with anything you grow there, it reduces the compaction, which is a, a really nice finding. This is yield from 2021. So 2021 was a really high yielding year. So we don't see the marked differences between the, different, between the treatments. Um, but we do see this pattern, and we'll focus on Langhorn Creek here. Casbar and fescue have lower yields. Um, than say your herbicide and your medic mix. And in 2021, the medic mix had the highest yield um, and that was significantly higher than the Casbar. But there's, you know, there's a bit of error margin there. So we wouldn't say it's higher than the, the herbicide, but, but that's okay because it's, it's a pretty big finding, right? If, if we're not having to spray, you're saving all that diesel and the, and the chemical um, and you're getting the same or better yields. So, um, that's just in one year, and we've got this data from the last um, six years, as I mentioned, and uh, this is the same data, but in box plots. Oh, this is the year before, so it's slightly more obvious difference. Um, but when we look at the, the six-year average and put that together in a model and, and um, take into account time, um, this, is, this is the result. So, and this is the result from Langhorne Creek. So highly irrigated, but we still see this big difference. Medic and rye, highest overall, not necessarily any better than the herbicide, statistically, but definitely better than your perennial grasses. Um, and the fact that we're getting all of these different treatments not massively different than the herbicide is, is a big finding. It means that you can grow things under vine and, um, and not suffer any penalty. And this is taking into account all those years. It's been pretty dry, especially those early seasons. There were a sort of drought up there. Um, the last two seasons have been very good. So what's the driver of yield effects? Um, I talked about canopy before, the reduction in canopy um, being caused by, um, by those aggressive grasses. Here we looked at um, 
and this is data from Langhorne Creek at both sides. So we looked at leaf area index, canopy size, the vines were much bigger with herbicide and the straw mulch, medic and rye in the medic mix, and you see this drop for casbar and fescue. Um, and then when we looked at pressure bombing, so we looked at uh, stem water potential in the vines, um, March 2020, it was a pretty dry summer and herbicide much more stressed than the other treatments. And this all had the same irrigation throughout the, throughout the trials. So the key messages are with the, right, with the right cover crop species in vineyards, or in our vineyards, we wouldn't expect to see a reduction in yield. Um, canopy size um, with mulch and the right cover crop as well is maintained or bigger than, than medic, uh, sorry, than medic, than herbicide. Um, we measured soil nitrogen and mineralised nitrogen across the seasons. Um, and you can see mineralised nitrogen as it breaks down throughout the season, goes up and up um, through summer. And you can increase soil, soil organic carbon. But if you, if you let the wrong species grow, and, and by wrong species, I don't mean the odd flea bane plant growing in your medic and rye, or there's, you know, bits and pieces here that's, that's come into your, your system. I mean, if you, if you go out and you plant casbar in a dry system, you're going to expect to see a penalty in yield. Um, and with the competitive grasses, higher water stress, which has led to that, that difference in um, the pressure bombing results. So I said I wouldn't take long. I think I took a while, but um, yeah, that summarises pretty well. So um, thanks for the opportunity to talk.